Why is religious freedom so important? Why do we say that it's the most fundamental first freedom that we all enjoy? What do we say to people in the culture who insist that religious freedom is just code for bigotry? We'll answer these questions and more with our special guest today, Dr. Robert George, professor of Princeton University, and welcome. So glad to have you with us, Robbie. Brother Scott, it's such a pleasure to be here with you. Thank you for inviting me onto the podcast. So what makes you so passionate? I want to hear sort of personally from you. What makes you so passionate about the subject of religious freedom? You've written tons on it. Why has it been such a focus of your attention? It's because I believe that people, human beings, men and women, are made in the very image and likeness of the divine creator and ruler of all that is. That means that we have profound worth. We have profound inherent and equal dignity. And as a result of that belief, I'm impelled to do what I can to uphold the dignity of human beings. And there's nothing more fundamental to the dignity of human beings than their right to raise the basic questions of meaning and value the ultimate questions, the existential questions, the questions of whether there is a more than merely human source of meaning and value, whether there is a God, what does God require of us? And then to answer those questions as best one can honestly, and to live with authenticity and integrity in view of one's best answers to those questions. If we do not permit people to do that, if we permit that fundamental right to be trampled, then the dignity of human beings, these precious creatures made in the very image and likeness of God, is undermined. Now, our dear mutual friend, who's since gone to be with the Lord, Chuck Colson, insisted that religious freedom is the first and most fundamental freedom that human beings enjoy, and that all of our other freedoms emerge from that. How would you defend that notion that religious freedom is not not just one of a, of a host of freedoms that we enjoy, but actually the most foundational. Well, sometimes religious freedom is called the first freedom, especially by Americans, uh, because it's the first freedom mentioned in our Bill of Rights, in our great charter of uh, freedoms. The First Amendment says that Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or the press or the right of the people to assemble and uh, petition the government peaceably for a redress of grievances. So religion is listed first. But that's not the reason it's most fundamental. It really works the other way around. I suppose it was the judgment that there is nothing more important than the freedom of conscience, the freedom of the mind, uh, the freedom to inquire about God and to live in line with one's best judgments about what God requires of us. It's because of our founders' judgment of the fundamental nature of that freedom that they placed it first, even before freedom of speech, even before freedom of the press, even before the right very important right to assemble and to petition the government for re- redress of grievances. Now, you, you've written on several occasions that the founders were also good students of history and that they understood what happens in cultures and in nations where religious freedom is not respected. So tell our listeners a little bit about the background that the founders came out of, which heightened their appreciation for the role of religious freedom. Well, of course, one of the things that they knew from from history is that uh, where uh, religious freedom is absent, all other freedoms disappear. Uh, In that sense, religious freedom does appear to be, at least from our historical experience, foundational and necessary to the preservation of other freedoms. Now, it's not exactly the same thing as freedom of speech or freedom of the press or due process of law or the equal protection of the laws, but it's fundamental in those civil liberties from the historical perspective, because when it disappears, everything else goes along with it. Now, our founders also knew that people could, uh, where there were religious differences, fundamental religious differences, uh, turn religion into a reason to resort to violence with each other or turn religion into a reason for oppression or repression. They were very concerned about that. They knew that they were founding a pluralistic country. It was mainly Protestant Christians at the time, but the difference between the different denominations was considered pretty deep and pretty pretty wide. There were a small number of Catholics and a small number of Jews. Uh, There was a very small number of Muslims here at the the time and some others. Uh, But basically their culture was one in which you had Congregationalists and Episcopalians and and Baptist, different Protestant denominations, 
who took their differences very seriously, and the founders did not want those differences to be the impetus for civil strife, civil unrest, conflict, or repression. Some have inferred from that that our First Amendment guarantee of religious freedom, that the American principle of religious freedom, um, is what is sometimes called uh, an article of peace. Uh, but I think it's more than just that. I think religious freedom was understood by our founders to be necessary, not simply because if we didn't respect it, we would end up with war, civil war, civil strife uh, over religion. Uh, if you read Madison on this subject, or you read Jefferson for that matter, who was the least religious of the founders, he was not an atheist. Sometimes he's accused of being an atheist. Uh, there's a certain sense in which you might say he was a deist or a Unitarian uh, but uh, not a deist even in the modern sense of that uh, term. But even someone like Jefferson fully understood the existential importance of raising religious questions, answering them honestly, and living with authenticity and integrity in view of one's best answers. And so a Jefferson, uh, a Madison, or other founders could appreciate the importance of religious liberty, not just to, ma to the maintenance of civil peace and order, but also to the flourishing of human beings as creatures who are naturally askers of religious questions. Human beings as creatures who naturally aspire to know the truth about ultimate things, the truth about God, and to get themselves right with God, to get themselves in line with what God requires of us. We, you, we might say into friendship uh, with, with God. Our founders themselves, of course, had different Mm -hmm. uh, views about uh, religion. Right. Some were more religious, some were less religious. Some were certainly what we would fully call today Christians. Uh, others were uh, were not. But I think broadly among the founders, there was an appreciation of the existential importance of religion understood in the way that I've just uh, described it. Yeah. So the founders, they had they had prudential concerns based on their, their history because they'd seen violence occur so often. But they also, it sounds like they also had a, a, a good theological understanding of a human being. That's right. I mean, Madison's own discussions, for example, of the importance of the freedom of the mind, that we couldn't really have faith in God if it was compelled, that a compelled faith is no faith at all. Um, I mentioned this morning in remarks I made here at, uh, at Biola in my uh, chapel address that... Uh, uh, we can, government can, law can, power can compel the external acts that are sometimes the manifestations of true faith. You can force somebody to go to a church service. You can force somebody to attend a Passover Seder. Uh, you can uh, force somebody to go to the mosque. But you're just forcing outward behavior. What you can't reach, what law, what the state, what government, what power cannot reach are the internal acts of intellect and will that are the very substance of faith. Going to the mosque, going to the church, going to the synagogue, those are manifestations of faith. They're very important. They're, they're, they're not mere window dressing. They're the real thing, but they only have genuine meaning and substance when they reflect internal judgments, internal acts of intellect and will that are the real substance of faith. This is why we can have faith even if we're locked in solitary confinement in a prison mm -hmm. cell. We have no access to a clergyman. We have no access to the Bible or to the scripture of our religion. We have no access to a religious service. We can still perform the acts of intellect and will that are the very substance of faith. And even in circumstances of complete freedom, if I'm just falsely manifesting faith, maybe because in my culture, manifesting faith is necessary for me to be in business or to get ahead or for political reasons or whatever. That's not real faith. Going to church, just going to church is not real faith. Going to church because I judge that the Lord wishes me to worship him in this way, in this place, in this manner, that's real faith. Right. Now, We've known for some time that religious freedom has been under assault globally. You know, the stories of the persecuted church have been well, well publicized. Uh, in our own, we gave our own Colson Award to Brother Andrew yes. you know, several years ago. Who He's wonderful, wonderful man. Um, but we hear more conversation today about how religious freedom is under assault in the West, in the United States in particular. 
What do you, what do you make of that claim that religious freedom is 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 under attack today in the United States? Is that true? Or... Uh, yes, it's certainly true. Okay. It, it's how, how, true. What's the evidence yeah. of that? Well, the evidence is uh, laws, for example, that would compel uh, a Christian or Orthodox Jewish or, or Muslim uh, physician uh, to perform or refer for or be trained in the practice of abortion that would compel a uh, Christian uh, uh, florist or website uh, designer uh, or musician uh, to participate in a uh, celebration of a same-sex relationship that, according to the uh, religious faith and conscience uh, of the individual, uh, he or she could not approve and participate in. Uh, you see this in efforts to use anti-discrimination laws to compel conformity with secular progressive doctrines, which are directly contrary uh, to the Christian uh, moral understanding of, of things. So yes, religious freedom is uh, under assault in the United States. Now, thank God, uh, nobody is being killed in the United States for uh, their religion, and that is happening in other places in the world. Uh, when I was serving, so this would be back in 2016, I haven't uh, checked the figures since then, but when I was serving as chairman of the uh, U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, uh, we found that something approaching three-quarters of the world's population lived under regimes that were in serious ways disrespectful of basic rights of religious liberty, whether we're talking about uh, Buddhists in Tibet, uh, uh, house church Christians uh, and others in, in, in China, uh, whether we're talking about uh, uh, the Rohingya Muslims uh, in Myanmar, whether we're talking about the Ahmadiyya Muslims in uh, Saudi Arabia or uh, in uh, uh, Pakistan, uh, whether we're talking about Jews in uh, various places, whether we're talking about evangelical and other Christians, Catholics and others in, in other places, that's a lot of the world's population living under regimes that repress their free exercise of, of, uh, of religion. So we've got a problem. We've got a problem in the world and we've got a problem in the country. Yeah, sometimes I think that that, that stark contrast between what's happening in other parts of the world where people are being imprisoned and being killed and churches are being burned and, yeah. you know, I mean, all sorts of terrible things are happening to people of all religious stripes. I mean, I think about the, the Uyghur Muslims, for example, in China. Uh, that's another good example, uh, yes. You know, where they, the estimate is close to three million of them live in something akin to concentration camps. Yes, today. and are subjected to terrible atrocities such as the uh, removal of organs for transplantation, commercial sale. Uh, it's just a nightmare, and we don't hear enough about what happens to to those and other religious minorities yeah, around my, the world. But part of, I think the, the the fact that there's such a stark contrast, I think, would lead some folks to take the the assault on religious freedom in the U.S. maybe not quite as seriously, because you think, well, you know, what what, what are you complaining about here? You you really have it pretty good compared to the way religious believers are treated in other parts of the world. Well, we're rather fond in our country of our basic constitutional principles. <laughs> yeah. uh, we really do believe, uh, uh, we hold uh, as self-evident that all men are created equal, endowed with their creator with certain unalienable rights, and among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We believe in our First Amendment. Uh, we believe in our constitutional principle of no religious test for public office. We're committed to these things, and we're right to be committed to these things, That's because right. these are true and good principles. And when we see these principles being eroded, often in subtle and insidious ways, it really is up to us to defend the American experiment in ordered liberty. Our, under, our founders understood that what they established here, this Republican form of government, this system of ordered liberty was an experiment. It might or might not work. And it would only last if each generation was zealous in its protection of the basic understanding of civil liberty, the basic constitutional order, the constitutional structure that they would bequeath to us. And it really is our duty. It really is our responsibility. If someone's rights to religious freedom are being uh, violated uh, by government at any level, then it really is incumbent on all of us, no matter how small the violation appears to be, to say, no, we're not putting up with that. We're not going to stand for it. There are mechanisms for political redress in our constitutional system, and we are going to avail ourselves of those mechanisms. And we're going to set right 
the wrong. But it's really important that we do that for everybody, not just for the people of our own faith. Uh, I, as a Christian, should be speaking out in defense of the rights of my fellow Christians when they are violated. But I, as a Christian and as American, also need to be speaking out for the rights of Muslims, the rights of Jews, the rights of Buddhists, the rights of Hindus. doesn't matter what their faith is. Our responsibility is to protect their basic right to practice that faith. Uh, you know, and inclu- including people who express no faith. Exactly right. That's right. I, as I said in my Biola uh, address this morning, uh, the morning we're recording this, uh, even atheists have a right to religious freedom. Some people think that's odd. How can they? They don't believe in religion. They don't believe in God. How can they have a right to religious freedom? But they have the right to raise fundamental questions, to answer them as best they can honestly in their very best judgment, and then to live with authenticity and integrity in view of their best answers. And if their answers are, I don't think that there is a supreme being, I do not think that there is a personal God, then we have to respect their right to reach that conclusion in good faith and to act in line with that conclusion, you know, so long as what applies to absolutely everybody, they respect the rights of others. Right. Now, Robbie, one of the, I think, more subtle ways that religious freedom is being challenged today in, in the West is by the, uh, maybe the, the impetus toward same-sex marriage and sexuality, the sexuality trends that are exist in the culture. And we hear frequently that, quote, religious freedom is nothing more than code for bigotry, that it, allow, it allows religious believers to discriminate against gays and lesbians, uh, in particular in their view of marriage. How, how do you respond to the folks in the culture who say that this is just another code word for bigotry and prejudice? Well, that sounds to me like bigotry and prejudice, <laughs> claiming bigotry and prejudice. Uh, the fact of the matter is uh, people who believe in the dogmas and doctrines of the sexual revolution have embraced a religion, a worldview, a pseudo-religion. Uh, they've got a system of meaning and value. They have an understanding of uh, what's important in life. They have a system of, of values that confi- conflicts with and competes with others, with the Jewish, with the Muslim, with the Christian understanding of uh, ultimate matters and basic moral questions. Uh, We have no right in advance of a proper exercise of the democratic process. We have no right to simply declare ourselves to be the victors, but they have no right to simply declare themselves to be the victors or to use the mechanisms of law to to repress the rights of of other people. We have to make a decision. Any culture has to make a decision what will we legally recognize as marriages? Will we legally recognize only what we as Christians would call genuine conjugal marriages, the conjugal union of husband and wife? Uh, or will we uh, count as marriages polygamous partnerships? Will we count as marriages polyamorous unions? Uh, the difference being polygamy is one man in separate marriages to two or three or four or more women. Polyamorous so called marriages uh, being marriages between groups of people, so three or five people of whatever uh, sexes are married together in a sexual ensemble. Uh, Yeah. Now, society's got to make a decision about that. We have constitutional mechanisms for making the decisions. I happen to think those mechanisms were hijacked uh, by an improper exercise of judicial authority by the Supreme Court of the United States in the Obergefell opinion imposing same-sex marriage on the country, rather than leaving it where the Constitution actually leaves the question to the people acting through the normal democratic process, through their elected representatives or in states like California through referendum and, uh, and, and initiative. But every society's got to uh, make a judgment of that one way or another, and it simply will not do for people on the competing sides to try to dismiss the right of other people to participate in that democratic process by labeling them as haters or bigots or anything else. We've got to deal with each other's arguments. It would be wrong for me to respond to a good faith argument in favor of same-sex marriage by saying, only perverts believe that. That would be wrong. I wouldn't do such a thing. But they are under the same obligation not to respond to genuine good faith arguments for the conjugal view of marriage by saying, only a bigot would believe that. You people who believe in marriage as a man and a woman are, are bigots. That's just an improper, unfair, illicit way of trying to win outside the democratic process. 
you know, we in academic circles, we call those ad hominem arguments, where That's you exactly attack the person doing. and not the position. I had a friend of mine who said that an ad hominem argument is where a person sits on the horns of a dilemma and decides to shoot the bull <laughs> instead. Yeah. Uh, and I think there, there's there's something to that. And I mean, in, in academic circles, we consider those arguments to be sort of the the last bastions of the intellectually desperate. Yeah. That's the only resort to those as the last resort. Today, we're resorting to those as a first resort. And, but I think the goal is the same, and that's really insightful to say the goal is actually to exclude participants from the democratic process of, of making their views able to be heard. It's, it's trying to declare victory uh, ahead of the game being played. Or it's, it's, it's like a pitcher declaring himself to be the umpire and then calling, you know, 27 batters up, 27 batters down on three strikes each time. Yeah, and, and, I, and I won that contest. <laughs> uh, now, closely related, I think, to religious freedom is this notion of free speech. On, in particular, we hear, we hear a lot of debate about the, the place of free speech on college campuses. So we're, if you had to describe for our listeners the state of free speech on the average state university campus— or the average sec- private secular campus, what would you say? It's perilous. The state of free speech is uh, perilous. Uh, people are afraid to speak their minds. People are afraid to dissent from the prevailing orthodoxies, which are overwhelmingly secular, progressive, or liberal dogmas on their, their campuses. Uh, not only are students afraid to speak, faculty members are afraid to dissent. Uh, they may have qualms about whatever the latest... Uh, woke dogma is, uh, transgenderism or whatever it is, but they keep their mouths shut. They censor themselves. They engage in self-censorship because they fear the consequences, professionally or personally or both, of speaking their minds. Now, universities can't work in atmospheres of fear and intimidation. They just can't work. The whole point of a university is to be a truth-seeking institution. The truth is the goal. The truth is the telos. The truth is the reason we have universities. We're trying to deeper and more deeply and deeply, um, more and more deeply understand the truth of things. We're trying to root out error. And to do that, we need the freedom to think, to inquire, to investigate, to argue, to criticize. And once that freedom is erased, whether by formal mechanisms of law or by the suffocating atmosphere of public Mm -hmm. opinion, you are no longer in the truth-seeking business. What happens when truth-seeking leaves the scene? What happens when we're not doing truth-seeking anymore? What are we doing in universities? We're doing propaganda. We're propagandizing. We're indoctrinating. We're not teaching. We're not encouraging students to think for themselves. We're stuffing their heads full of whatever our own favored dogmas are. No learning takes place. Knowledge is not advanced. The truth is not our understanding of the truth is not deepened. So the situation on college campuses today is that we've, we're undermining the very justifying purpose and constitutive aim of universities by allowing this spirit of intimidation and fear to, this atmosphere of intimidation and fear to maintain, be maintained on campus. So we've got to do something about that. We have to overcome self-censorship. We have to make sure that people feel free and indeed are free to raise questions, speak their minds, criticize, defend, critique. Now, how, you know, you, uh, based on your deeply held religious views and your deeply held conservative political positions, puts you at odds, I think, with the prevailing winds in, in, this, in the secular university. Um, how, how have you been able to, yourself, been able to, to battle some of those really strong headwinds that I suspect you've had to deal with uh, in your tenure at Princeton? Well, I've always just spoken my mind. I've um, spoke what I believe to be the truth as God gives me to, uh, to see the truth. I understand that to be my obligation. I also understand it to be my obligation to exemplify and to practice the virtue of intellectual humility. I need to get better at it, but, but I try and I understand mm-hmm. that that's important because the one thing I can be absolutely sure about is my own fallibility. And anybody who recognizes his or own, her own fallibility recognizes that the only way that they're going to be able to make any progress toward uh, eliminating the falsehoods they happen to believe and swapping out those falsehoods for truth is by allowing their beliefs to be challenged by other people. 
and to engage those other people in a genuine truth-seeking spirit. Don't try to shut them down, but also don't turn your back to them and refuse to listen. Somebody who recognizes his own fallibility and understands that he could be wrong not only about the minor, superficial, trivial things of life, but even about the big, important things of life, the most, the most significant questions, will want other people to be free to challenge him so that he can test his views and see if they need to be revised or, or, or replaced. So I engage my colleagues in that spirit. Uh, I am certainly willing uh, to listen, but I expect them to listen as well. I have found that when you develop a reputation very early on from the beginning of being someone who can't be intimidated, can't be rolled, can't be, as they say today, canceled, the, the mob leaves you alone. They know they can't get you, so they'll move on to someone else. I, I, I liken it to the burglar. If the burglar sees mm-hmm. that a particular house in a neighborhood is, is well defended, it's got an alarm system and so forth, he's not going to bother trying to figure out how to beat the alarm system. It's going to go on to the next house, the one that's undefended, that doesn't have the alarm system. And I'm afraid it works that way when it comes to academic life and the imposition of dogmas as well. Uh, if you're a faculty member um, who has a reputation for uh, not being afraid of them, not being afraid of the mob, being unwilling to be intimidated or, or rolled, they'll move on to the next guy. Well, and it probably doesn't hurt that you've thought through these issues really carefully for a long time and are able to articulate positions in a very persuasive way. Well, I think it's very important, not only as a matter of self-defense, but more fundamentally to the truth-seeking enterprise. It's very important to try to understand your intellectual adversary's position in its best possible light, and indeed to understand your adversary's position even better than he or she uh, understands it. Uh, this, this, This is something that I think my students are often surprised about when they enter uh, my classes. They they know what I think because my um, um, views are pretty well known out there in the public, yeah, yeah. Uh, at least among my students. So they know what I think. I don't use my classroom to promote my views. I don't use my classroom to propagandize. But my students end up being surprised when they hear how well I make the counterargument against my own position. Mm-hmm. They're really surprised that I can do that better than they can. Or if they, if I invite a student to make a, a counterargument, say, against the pro-life position, and the student doesn't do a good enough job, I will improve it. I will strengthen it. Uh, I'll, I'll make the argument as well as someone who was really mm-hmm. dedicated to the pro-abortion position would, would make it. Now, I also then explain why I come out the, uh, uh, the other way on the issue, and I give my, uh, my reasons. But that's really what education should be all about presenting students with the best arguments, the best things that have been thought and said on the competing sides of the question. And that doesn't apply just to political and moral questions. It really applies to a wide range of questions, even in the area of literary criticism, the interpretation of literary works. Let's say you're trying to interpret some passages, understand some passages in Jane Austen's novel, Emma. And let's say you have a dispute. This critic says this, that critic says that. They interpret this passage or this scene differently. If you're teaching Emma to your students in the English literature class, it has nothing to do with politics. You should present mm-hmm. this critic's view and that critic's view, this critic's reasons for holding his view, that critic's reasons for holding her view, and then leave it to the student to think it through and decide for himself or herself who she thinks or he thinks has the better argument. It's not our job as professors to tell our students what to think. We're to provide them with the best that has been said on competing sides and then trust them to think it through and come to the conclusion they think warranted. Now, would your approach be a bit different if you were in a distinctly Christian university like Biola, where we have a, you know, we have a set of theological convictions that we hold very dearly to? Um, and, you know, we, we try our best to give, to give our students uh, exposure to people who think really differently than we do. But it's, but, we're also really committed to our students being within those theological boundaries that we set out as well. So would your, would your approach be any different? Not much. Uh, I, I'm a pluralist when it comes to universities. I think that different kinds of universities do different kinds of things and do them well. They're all in the truth-seeking business, mm-hmm. so they approach it in different ways. 
So I'm, I'm, I'm glad that we have both public state-funded universities and private universities, and I'm glad that we have non-sectarian universities, both state, all state universities are non-sectarian, of course, in our society, but also private non-sectarian universities, and we have religious universities. I'm a great believer in the Biolas and the Notre Dames and the Yeshivas and the Zaytunas and the Baylors and the Houston mm-hmm. Baptist, and, you know, I, I, I think that they add an enormous amount to the uh, overall educational uh, and scholarly effort in the country. I think it's fine to begin from a set of presuppositions. We all, to some extent, right. even in non-sectarian universities, proceed from certain sorts of presuppositions. We should always be willing to have them yeah. be challenged and to be thinking them through and so forth. Mm-hmm. But you we, don't sh- begin we should from be clear. We should be nowhere. clear about them. We should too. be clear. Yeah, that's absolutely yeah. right. We should be clear about them. Right. But uh, I don't think that the difference in how one teaches. Uh, would be too great between uh, a non-sectarian university like Princeton, where I teach, uh, or a a religious university like uh, Biola. You should still be exposing the students to the best that has been thought and said and not putting a thumb on the scale. You still have to trust the student to arrive at the truth of things. Now, it's kind of easy for me to say that because of some other beliefs I have that are really connected to my own Christian convictions. I believe that truth has not only power, but a certain profound luminosity. The late pontiff, Pope John Paul II, wrote a magnificent encyclical on truth and on truth-seeking. And he didn't call it the power of truth, and he didn't call it the purpose of truth. He called it the splendor of truth. And he was pointing to that luminosity, that appeal, that attractiveness that truth has. I think if the truth is fairly presented to students and then competing views are also presented, that they'll be able to sort it out and will experience that splendor of truth. They're, they're intelligent. They're, they're, they're not stupid people. You don't have stupid kids at Biola. You have smart kids, right? And they're able to sort through arguments. They'll, they'll understand where the evidence leads. They'll be able to be logically rigorous and precise in their analysis. So to me, it's, it's no, I don't worry. Oh, my students will be led astray because they read Nietzsche. I assign them Nietzsche. I assign them Marx. I assign them writings by people that I think are way out of line and whose writings have done, I think, enormous damage in the history of humanity. Think of Marx's Mm -hmm. work. Think of the corpses piled up as a result of Marxist uh, ideology. And yet, I will assign with no qualms the Communist Manifesto uh, or uh, uh, on the Jewish question or parts of Capital or any of Marx's uh, other works. I want to make sure, though, that students also read the best that's been said by Solzhenitsyn or by Hayek or by John Paul II by way of the criticism, criticism of the Marxist view. I have no real question about where students are going to come out when they hear the best arguments on the competing sides. Because I know where the truth lies there. Let me go back to uh, the questions of marriage and sexuality for a minute. Sure. You, you've written in the past that you believe the tide might be turning uh, in, the, in the public's view of marriage and sexuality. Can you spell out a little bit more what you mean by that and what, what's the evidence for the, the tide being turned? I mean, I think the, the public's understanding of marriage has continued to erode. Uh, the erosion really began with the sexual revolution. And of course, if you start tracing things back, you end up eventually at the Garden of Eden. But I would take them back to the 1920s, the writings of people like uh, Wilhelm Reich. Then, of course, a, a very important moment in the destruction of people's basic understanding of sexuality and marriage here in the West was uh, Alfred Kinsey's, the publication and glorification of Alfred Kinsey's pseudoscience of sexuality, which had a deep and very ugly um, uh, set of consequences for people. It just misled people powerfully. Yeah. Uh, talk about obscuring the truth. He really was able to obscure the truth. And he knew what he was doing, by the way. He was a fraud. Kinsey was a fraud. Uh, his whole point was ideological. It was not scientific. He knew he wasn't doing actual science. He was out with a political or moral agenda. He wanted to transform people's understanding of sexuality to overthrow the old Judeo-Christian uh, understanding, the biblical and natural law understanding and replace it with a, a kind of sexual anarchist uh, understanding of sexuality. Hugh Hefner's uh, mainstreaming of pornography in the 1950s, uh, the 
sexual revolution of the 1960s and and so forth, the introduction of no-fault divorce, the uh, normalization of -of uh, out-of-wedlock child-bearing and uh, promiscuity, uh, sexual cohabitation outside the bond of marriage. And and then, of course, marriage itself began to be revised legally, first with the introduction of no-fault divorce, which undermined the public's understanding of marriage as a genuine conjugal partnership, leading eventually to people being unable to see why marriage is between a man and a woman. The whole basic understanding of marriage had been so badly eroded that people would really struggle. Even people who thought that marriage was a man and a woman would struggle to figure out why that was the case. That's why Sharif Girgis, Ryan Anderson, and I wrote our book, What is Marriage, Man and Woman in Defense, to explain to people what at some level they knew but could only glimpse through a glass darkly about the nature of marriage as a conjugal partnership, as a partnership that brings together man and woman as husband and wife to be father and mother to any children born of that union, giving them the inestimable blessing of being brought up in the love of uh, and committed relationship, the marriage, the conjugal partnership of the two people who brought, whose coming together brought them into being, and also giving them the great blessing of uh, having paternal and maternal care and role, uh, role models. But people had lost their sense of that. Uh, as you know, Scott, I've also um, been uh, one of the people who's been reviving the ancient Aristotelian wisdom that law, in addition to all its other functions, functions as a teacher, that law shapes and is not only shaped by, but shapes our cultural understandings. It shapes our consciousness. And our law has been teaching very bad lessons about marriage. It's been misinforming us about marriage since we revised our laws to accommodate no-fault divorce uh, in the 1960s and and 70s. And of course, now our law teaches that marriage is just a a, uh, matter of sexual romantic companionship or domestic uh, partnership. Well, having been misinformed, especially by the law, now for so many years, it's little wonder uh, that people don't understand what marriage is, that marriage rates are declining that marriage dissolution is so common, that failures of marriage formation are are ubiquitous. Uh, It's really no surprise at all. So I don't see the tide turning, but that's no excuse for Christians and others who would join with us, our our Jewish and Muslim brothers and sisters in particular. Anybody, we should be prepared to join together with anybody who will join together with us to restore the fundamental understanding of marriage as a conjugal partnership, just as we have every obligation to join together in other great causes, the sanctity of life, religious freedom, every good and important cause. Yeah, now one one final question that sort of relates to that. You've been fairly well known for your friendships with people who disagree uh, significantly with you on a lot of major issues. Your friendship with Cornel West, for example, and the, the sort of traveling you know, traveling set of engagements that you did with him. What, what, what did you hope to accomplish by that, by your very public friendship and engagements with someone who disagrees with you on virtually everything, uh, like Cornell West? My goal and Cornell's goal, are, the goal of our work together is to get at the truth of things. Both of us are committed to the idea that the way to get at the truth of things is with respectful, robust, truth-seeking discourse and engagement. Uh, He's committed to that every bit as much as I'm committed to that. I'm committed to that every bit as much as he's committed to that. And that makes us, I think, a great partnership. Now, you know, people say it's wonderful that you're exemplifying civil discourse and truth-seeking discourse for people. And and that's something that we're happy about. And it's, it's part of the reason we do what we do make the effort to get together so often. We go on the road and mm-hmm. and we bring our gospel of the importance of truth-seeking, freedom of speech, civil discourse. But behind that is something more fundamental, and that is just our dedication to trying to get at the truth of things. Uh, I engage deeply, as deeply and as often as I can with Cornell, not simply to show other people how they should behave, but to get at the truth mm-hmm. of things that Cornell and I sometimes agree about, sometimes disagree about. Where we agree about them, we want to deepen our understanding. Where we disagree about them, we want to see if one or the other of us needs to revise his, uh, his understanding. Um, it's, it's that joint commitment 
undoubtedly rooted in the fact that we are both Christians. It's that joint commitment to truth-seeking that um, is at the foundation, really, of our, of our relationship. Yeah, and you, you, you do model it so well. You both do model the kind of win- winsomeness that goes with having strong convictions. And that, that's, that's a message that the culture really needs, that those aren't mutually exclusive. This is, a, this is something that especially our young people have trouble understanding. Um, when we travel together, the question that Cornell and I are asked most often by young people, by students, this is not a question we get very often from older people, from faculty members or community people who attend our events, but from students. The question is, how can I be as open-minded as you guys want us to be, Professor West and Professor George? How can I be that open-minded and still be a person of conviction? If I'm a person of conviction and of action, don't I have to really believe in what I am fighting for? And don't I have to be intolerant of competing beliefs? And the answer that Cornell and I both give is that it's perfectly possible and desirable. It's necessary to be both a person of conviction and somebody who is keenly aware, cognizant, of one's own fallibility. And if you're cognizant of your own fallibility, you will never want to shut down a critic, shut down an interlocutor. You will never want to immunize any of your beliefs, even your deepest, most cherished, even your most identity-forming beliefs. You won't want to immunize them from critique. The knowledge that I might be wrong or not completely right or in need of at least some revision of my thinking or deepening of my thinking will always cause me to see an intellectual adversary not as an enemy to be destroyed, but as a friend and a partner in the pursuit of truth. I remember my mentor when I was in grad school had a, had a way of putting it. He said, beware of hardening of the categories. <laughs> he said, much more lethal than hardening of the arteries. Yeah. So, Robbie, this has been so rich. Thank you so much for your time on this and for answering our questions. I hope our listeners have enjoyed this. I, I'm sure they have. Uh, This has been such a good time. So thank you so much for your time today. My pleasure, Scott, and such a joy to be with you again. This has been an episode of the podcast, Think Biblically, Conversations on Faith and Culture, brought to you by Talbot School of Theology at Biola University, offering programs in Southern California and online, including our Master's in Christian Apologetics, now offered fully online. Visit biola.edu slash Talbot in order to learn more. If you enjoyed today's conversation with our friend Robert George, Give us a rating on your podcast app and share it with someone else. Thanks so much for listening. And remember, think biblically about everything. Mm -hmm.